As we sit here right now, John Tory will not be the longest serving mayor in Toronto's history, as he would have been had he completed the term he was just elected to less than four months ago. Instead, he's become, yet again, another infamous leader of Canada's largest city, leaving in disgrace, and just as the strong mayor powers he'd lobbied for were about to come in handy in passing a budget bigger than half the provinces of this country. What happened and what's to come? With us on that, let's welcome former chief planner for the City of Toronto, mayoral candidate in 2018, Jennifer Kiesmat, who now runs Marquee Developments. Sabrina Maddow, columnist for the National Post. Marcus G, columnist for the Globe and Mail. And City Hall reporter for the Toronto Star, Ben Spur, who helped break this story. And it's great to welcome all of you back to TVO for this uh, bizarre time in the history of the capital city of the province of Ontario. Ben, you first. How long have you been working on this story? Um, we, we first got some tips last uh, December around that time about uh, the mayor's marriage potentially being in trouble, but we didn't really think that that was a, a big story necessarily. It was something we were kind of keeping an eye on, but it was only within the last two weeks or so that we um, got uh, some tips about uh, the mayor being in a relationship with someone uh, who used to work in his office, and it was just over that, that period of time that we've been really trying to pin the story down. You, you say you became aware of the story last December. How did you become aware? Aware of it. Um, so I, I should say, you know, this is a, a story that we've been working on with my uh, with the City Hall Bureau, led by David Ryder and my colleague Alicia Hasham. Um, we, we just kind of heard. I would describe it as almost kind of gossip in political circles that sort of flown in our, that obviously I can't say we can't we have to protect our sources of course but this was something um, that was kind of known about I mean a lot of people remarked on the fact that um, uh, the mayor's wife was not with him at his uh, victory party last October which was a little strange just about uh, because of how much he talked about um, you know uh, her being a, a big part of his life of course and kind of uh, giving his, her blessing for uh, him to, to run as mayor um, so it, it was notable her absence there um, so that kind of tipped us off that that there might be something more going on. But as I say, it was only within the last couple of weeks that uh, we were really able to nail down uh, what this potential relationship was, uh, and it was with someone in his office. And that, to us, uh, made it seem that it was uh, very much in the public interest to pursue. Because the person with whom he had the relationship worked in his office as a subordinate. Yeah, that's I, the think, story. I think if he had had an affair with someone outside of his office, that's his private life. And but you would not have reported on that? I, I don't think we would have, no. Uh, I think the fact that um, it, that he it was with someone in his office raised the idea of potentially an abuse of power. I think our understanding of how relationships work uh, these days, I think, is, has, has evolved to the point where I think there are questions raised about, raised about consent when uh, there's a relationship between a, a boss and an employee, to the extent to which that can ever be truly consensual, I think, is, is a matter for debate, and also just that the fact that it was someone in his office raises questions about whether or not um, it affected uh, his, his city duties in any way. So that, that's what really put it over the top for us to be a story in the public interest that we felt was uh, worth reporting. Okay, let's just get some reaction to this. Jennifer, you obviously uh, you ran against him four plus years ago. You spent time with him on the hustings, debating him and so on. You were chief planner when he was the mayor of Toronto. Um, I just want to know your initial reaction when you heard about all this. Could you believe it? No, I couldn't believe it. Um, and as you know, we had a rocky relationship in the beginning, John Tory and I. The Gardner Expressway, of course, was a, was a very big story. Uh, but then we kind of worked it out, and we worked really, really closely together. The King Street Pilot was a project that we collaborated really closely on, transforming housing policy, affordable housing. We really worked very, very closely in those last two and a half years. So I will tell you, um, this was not something I think anyone who worked closely with him saw coming. Um, I think even his closing, close, closest advisors were completely flabbergasted that this, uh, you know, both about about the affair and, and about the announcement about the resignation. So, you know, my reaction was very similar to the reaction others had, which was, first of all, this can't be true. Secondly, wow, uh, the mayor just resigned and everything that just happened in the past eight years, poof, it's gone. There have been questions about his legacy. What will be John Tory's legacy? Well, hold off on that. We'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get so to that. that's, you know, I think the the big issue for me was thinking, what does this mean for the past eight years and what does it mean in terms of what comes next? All of which we are going to discuss tonight. Sabrina, your initial reaction when you heard about all this, this guy's nickname is No Story Tory. He's, he, I mean, boring was his calling card. What'd you think? After the Rob Ford era, he essentially had 
one job and one brand, and that was being boring, uneventful, and no major scandal. So it was a shock from that perspective. But then on the other hand, the story of an older male politician sleeping with a staffer, it's also a bit of a cliche. So it's both surprising and unsurprising at the same time. Uh, like Ben said, I think the big story is the potential abuse of workplace power, not only in how it may have impacted this woman and her career, but the larger workplace in general. Um, you remember there there will be other people competing for jobs with her. Perhaps other people in the office had to keep a secret. Um, overall, this is a workplace issue, and we know rule number one, don't sleep with your employees, and he broke that one. Marcus, what's the story here in your view? What is the, what is the overwhelming public interest here? I mean, my initial reaction, like Jennifer's and everyone else's, was, was shock because here's a guy who has worked all his life for this job and loves this job. Like, he, he gets up at, you know, in the, in the dark and, and his first one in City Hall, and he's just about the last one to leave. He's out every night doing his job. And he worked. He, he had a, a, a few stumbles in his earlier political career. He won, ran, ran once for mayor and, and didn't succeed. He went into provincial politics and didn't succeed. Then finally he got this job. He won once, he won twice. He won a third time. And he, as, you, as you mentioned, he could have been the longest serving uh, mayor in Toronto's history. And now this, uh, out of the blue, it was shocking. And also I think really sad when you think about the effect on his family. Uh, he's got grandchildren who will have to be told about this. Uh, the woman involved was, was kind of exposed on social media after people started sort of trawling through social media for it. So it's just sad and tawdry end to this, uh, to this just, mayoralty. Just while we're there, the star has not named this person. In fact, I mean, her name has come out on social media, but none of the so-called legacy media have printed her name. You think that's the right thing to do? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, she shouldn't be dragged into this. Unfortunately, she already has, if people want to look. And that's that's really that's really unfortunate because uh, you know you don't want this thing spreading around and people gossiping about you. It's a terribly painful episode. The whole thing. Okay, uh, do you know Rosie Demano? Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> I thought you might. Yeah. You guys worked at the same paper. Here's what she had to say, or some of what she had to say in her column just published. I don't question the reporting. I question why it was published. Where is the public service in outing an intensely private matter that appeared to have no political relevance, no legal shakiness, no employment inequity? And I ask that while honestly wondering why Tory stepped down so hastily, which might suggest there are further layers to the story to which I'm not privy. So let's hit this again. What is the compelling, compelling public interest in reporting on a consensual affair between two adults? Again, I think there is the issue of, of consent, the extent to which any relationship between a, a boss and their employee can be fully consensual when that relationship is happening in a public office. Uh, there are questions about whether the, the politician in that office is, is abusing the, their power. And then again, I think there are issues about to what extent this might have interfered with the um, uh, operation of this public office, which is a very powerful office. Do of we course. know whether that's happened? I, I don't think we have, uh, we haven't reported details that, that can kind of conclude either way but we do know that this staffer for instance uh, was on you know publicly funded trips with the mayor over the course of several years and, and we don't know the details of exactly uh, what happened on those trips or whether they took place before or after the relationship had begun but those are questions that I think are legitimate to ask I don't I don't know in what kind of uh, world or what media outlet wouldn't ask those questions. And I think it's notable that, you know, there are some people like my colleague who are, who are saying that this is not a, a story that's worth reporting. That's not what the mayor is saying. That when, when we put the questions to the mayor, uh, the, the response we got back on, on Friday night in a letter from uh, his, his lawyer was, you know, this was an error of judgment. It wasn't, this is not a story. Uh, it was, that this was a mistake. This was inappropriate. And, and the mayor was No question it was an error in judgment. Jennifer, is it a, is, is it a firing offense? In other words, did he have to resign? Well, I think Sabrina raised all of the key issues here. It's a workplace uh, issue. If the um, woman involved did not work at the City of Toronto, um, I don't think we would be sitting at this table. I don't think we would be in a situation where the mayor had resigned. But there's a power dynamic, and this was an inappropriate relationship between an employer 
and a staff person, and that is in the public interest because this is a public office. And there's an accountability to the public that comes with being in public office. And so some errors are errors that are significant enough that they ought to be discussed, they ought to be litigated in the public domain, and I think that's where we find ourselves right now. So, you know, I think it's also significant what Ben just said, that the mayor himself has said this was an error in judgment. And it's a significant one. The implications on co-workers, the implications on applying for jobs, the, the dynamic this creates at City Hall. I don't think anyone uh, is going to defend this as the type of culture that we want to see at City Hall. Nobody's going to defend it, but then, you know, and admittedly, this is almost 30 years ago, but the Bill Clinton example is instructive here in as much as he admitted to an error in judgment, he admitted he did something that was wrong, he powered through, he stayed on the job, he left office as the most popular president since polling began. Mm -hmm. Why was that not the precedent this time? Why was resignation the precedent? Well, I think we have a much better understanding about power dynamics, especially in the workplace when it comes to relationships, than we did 30 years ago during the Bill Clinton era. Even our viewing of how that was covered back then versus how we see it now and how we view Monica Lewinsky now, um, and she's come out and been able to tell her side of the story better, I don't think that situation would have necessarily gone down the same way today, um, at least for a politician that respects public office and has an ounce of shame. Mm -hmm. uh, we're so used to politicians not having that, which is why the resignation was in part surprising. But in this day and age, post Me Too, this is just simply not acceptable. Everyone knows the rules. This is public office. This is a workplace. This was not simply a private relationship. Toronto Star is not playing morality police. This is about a public office. And therefore, That's why it's not okay. And the resignation was appropriate in your view. That was ultimately his choice to make, but I think it's appropriate for the questions to be raised, and I believe that this was an issue. Absolutely. Marcus, I want to talk to you about shame, because that's an interesting angle in this story. Th there is no shame south of the border anymore. Politician, I mean, you look at the George Santos stuff. There is just no shame anywhere. People do stupid stuff all the time down there, and they just power through. I don't know if this is the right word to use, but were you impressed by the fact that the mayor realized that he'd done something really inappropriate and therefore resigned? Yeah, I think his reaction actually, uh, his, his statement was as dignified as you can expect in a, in a situation like this. First of all, he immediately said, look, I, I know I did something wrong. I'm deeply sorry. He's asking the integrity commissioner to look into it to make sure there wasn't any further um, wrongdoing on his part. Uh, he apologized to his family and the whole city and he said he let us all down. And so I think his, his, his response was actually good and as good as it could be in the circumstances. Okay, Let, let's fess up here. This program airs in the evening, but we are taping it earlier in the day. And as we sit here taping this, recording this, we don't have tape anymore. As we sit here recording this, he hasn't resigned yet. If there is a groundswell, as it appears to be happening, I don't know what your emails are all like, but mine are running 50 to 1 that he made a mistake resigning, and most, almost every email I'm getting from people says he shouldn't have resigned. If there is a groundswell for him to reconsider, should he? Well, first of all, I'd say I'd love to see the demographic data on the groundswell that you're seeing and that's in your inbox because it might be a bit different than mine. Um, you, it's and as mine many, too. It's, a, it, it's, <laughs> so as, there you it's go. as many women as men. Okay, so um, 50 to 1, I'm shocked by that. I, that's not what I'm hearing at all. Um, I think, uh, look, I think this, in some ways, the challenge we face right now is we're publicly litigating an intensely personal matter that has public implications <laughs> and has implications for the city. And that makes this an incredibly tricky thing to sort through. And so in speaking about this, I've tried to stay in the space of, look, um, we need to think about what's in the best interests of the city of Toronto, right? At the end of the day, John Tory has a lot of work to do to go sort out of his life because it's a pretty big mess. And, you know, one of the big questions that might be in the public interest is whether or not it's in the interest of the city to have someone who has, you know, some pretty serious work to be doing at home. Uh, we. There's a reason why politicians put a picture of their beautiful family and their two children on their brochures, because they want to portray that they're a portrait of responsibility and stability, because we see that, you know, we want people who are not chaotic and in, the, in a personal crisis mm -hmm. as our political leaders. I, I think that's something that is in the public interest. So there's this element of, well, now we know this is a man who's going through 
pretty much the greatest crisis someone could go through in their life. It doesn't look like it's going to get sorted out soon. So there's a question around that in relation to leadership for the city. Like, I think there's, there's a lot of different layers that keep getting added on to this. And... I don't know. I'm in some ways for me. I think if if John Tory was now to unre, you know resign, unresign, that might be pretty consistent with his brand. That might be pretty consistent with what we've seen in terms mm -hmm. of his leadership. And I don't know that that would necessarily help the city. But let me pick up on what you said. What's in the public interest here? And this is the thing that again, the emails, the people who tweet at me. This is the thing that they've been saying. Toronto's going through a budget crisis. This city needs an experienced hand at the, till, right, at the tiller right now, holding the tiller, to make sure uh, that it can get through this moment. Is this the moment when we need a guy with 50 years' experience in politics to go away and somebody brand new on the job to show up? That's the question that people are asking me. What do you think? Well, maybe he should have thought about that before he ran for yet another term as this relationship was going on. Um... I think he has to be held accountable. And the fact that he's already come forward and said this was wrong, I'm resigning, to then go back on that, I, I think that could do even more damage to his brand and throw the city into even more chaos because then we end up in this kind of Rob Ford era. Will he? Won't he? What's going on? Um, at this point, he's made his decision. I think he should stick to that. And perhaps he can resign a week or two from now. He can oversee the budget being seen in. But ultimately, I think he has to go at this point. Marcus, is there an argument to be made that with the huge budget crisis facing the city right now, somebody with Tory's experience should rescind his resignation and stay on the job. I think the opposite is actually true. I think it's a good time to get fresh leadership in the city. I mean, I, I, I agree with Sabrina. I don't, <clears throat> don't think he should have gone for a third term. Uh, he's had two already. Uh, there's all sorts of potential fresh new leaders and new ideas out there. Uh, he had said he wouldn't run, then changed his mind. And so I think it's a chance for a reset. I mean, Toronto's actually in a bit of trouble right now. We've got a lot of crime going on, a lot of violent incidents. We have a homelessness crisis. We have a housing crisis. We have a budget crisis. And so it's a real chance for a, re a reset. And I think uh, this could turn out to be a good thing for the city. Do you, I, I know you're a reporter as opposed to a columnist, so I don't know if you want to express a view on that, but are you hearing anything suggesting he might rescind his resignation. We, we are hearing that there are people trying to convince him to do that. The extent to which that's an organized um, effort, I think, is, is a little unclear. But at City Hall, that there is some chatter that, that there are people there who are going to press him to stick around. I think we are at this hour on Monday morning. We haven't heard that he's put in his resignation papers yet. So that, I think, is going to lead to speculation that he could stick around at least to see out this budget uh, that uh, goes to council on Wednesday. Um, so yeah, we're, it's, it's still unclear whether or not he might be around for a little bit longer um, after announcing he would resign. He's been on this program a lot, obviously, during the eight plus years that he was mayor. Let's play a clip of him in 2019 when he did this program. Sheldon, if you would, roll it. I don't care if I'm loved. I don't care if people think I'm exciting. I just care that people respect me and that they respect the job that I'm trying to do in terms of working hard to and working together with other governments to get things done. All right, let's talk legacy. If this, in fact, is the end of John Tory's mayoralty and potentially political career, how does the city remember him? Look, when I ran for mayor, um, John Tory then already had a problem, which was um, when you asked a person on the street what they thought of John Tory, they generally liked him. They thought he was a good man. Um, they liked that he was out in the community, that he was showing up. And then when you ask them, what has he done, uh, it dried up pretty quickly. And so my understanding was that this third term was about a legacy, legacy building opportunity in the absence of that having happened over the past eight years. And I should say that he came out of the gate really, really hard with a very bold housing plan just last month that had a lot of the elements that many of us housing advocates have been pushing for for many years. So he was kind of poised to actually to actually do it. Like he, it felt like he was on the cusp of doing the things we were hoping he would he would do. The challenge is that just got cut really short. So I'm not sure where that leaves us. Here's documentary filmmaker Barry Averich. Uh, writing in the Toronto Sun exactly three years ago. Uh, here's what he had. Sheldon, let's bring this up. I have enormous respect for him, John Tory, and I know he is working hard, but it would be great if one of the best mayors Toronto has had in a long time 
actually had a memorable legacy beyond showing up to everything and avoiding a scandal. Mm -hmm. Sabrina, I mean, this echoes a bit of what Jennifer mm -hmm. Kiesmatt just had to say. What do you look at when you point to a Tory legacy as mayor? I think, unfortunately, there won't be much of one after this. He, um, when we're talking about should he continue on, I don't think he's had such a stellar legacy or impact on this city that someone else can't step into the job and um, govern going forward. We look at housing, we look at violence, we look at public transit, like garbage being collected on the street by almost every measure. We've seen a huge amount of decline over the last nine years. Now, understandably, after the Ford era, people wanted someone who was stable, who was boring, for lack of a better word, who would be uneventful. But I would argue we got into this little bit of a rut that the city didn't know how to get out of. And that's not John Tory's fault, per se. People knew who they were voting for and what they were voting for. But perhaps this could be an opportunity for a new start. Marcus, legacy? I think people may be kinder in retrospect to John Tory than they are now. I mean, this was a very dramatic and, and uh, unfortunate end. But uh, first of all, in his first term, he did successfully return stability and integrity to, to uh, the city of Toronto after this terrible scandal we went through. Um, and he started working with other governments. Uh, he was much better at that than his predecessor. In his second term, there was COVID. And he was actually a superb leader of this city during COVID. He, he told everybody, go out and get vaccinated. He led this, along with Joe Cressy, the city councilor, led this uh, push to get out into the most disadvantaged communities and uh, work with community organizations to get people vaccinated. He was a steady hand at the tiller. So I think that's a substantial legacy there. He obviously had it, Ben, as a huge priority to get along with provincial leaders, with federal leaders, and managed to get billions of dollars out of those senior levels of government to put towards projects in the city of Toronto. Does he get credit for that? I think he should to, to some extent. Um, I think, you know, I think one of the things that's, that's so, um, you know, if you're a supporter of Tory is, is lamentable here is that he, he had also launched this campaign or said he was about to launch this campaign to win a new fiscal deal for cities, right? To negotiate with the other levels of government to make cities more financially sustainable. And that is the kind of bold um, campaign that, that we hadn't seen from him in the first two terms in office. So, um, you know, it would have been really interesting to watch how that played out and how successful um, he, he would have been in that. And now, of course, we'll, we'll never know. One of the things that I heard said, though, was that when Rob Ford, for example, went on the road as the mayor of Toronto, if he had to travel to Los Angeles to meet people in the film business, or if he had to go to the United Kingdom or whatever to try to drum up business, people often were nervous and even embarrassed about what he might do. Mm -hmm. You never worried when John Tory represented the city abroad. Is that fair to say? I, I think that that's probably fair to say. I mean, he, his whole brand, of course, is, is uh, as we've been saying, this kind of upstanding, um, you know, respectable person. Um, and, I, and I think that, that that's why uh, it's been, you know, people are shocked at his resignation. But I think, I think to some extent you can understand when his whole brand was this idea uh, of him being uh, kind of buttoned down and upright. And uh, all of a sudden that's kind of gone in one, one fell swoop. And you can see that he just didn't want to stick around to, to kind of tough it out. Well, let me pick up on that. Do, do the events of the last 72 hours, Jennifer, negate whatever achievements he may have had over the previous eight plus years, ultimately, at the end of the day? I don't know. I'm struggling with the conversation because, uh, you know, I was asked this the other day, is this bad for the brand of the city? And all I could think was what's bad for the brand of the city is people being afraid to go on the TTC. What's banned, bad for the brand of the city is the fact that we have seen an absolute crisis in homelessness in this city. What's br bad for the brand of the city is that the garbage bins are overflowing and broken mm -hmm. and the, the parks are falling apart. Like, you know, so I'm struggling a little bit because uh, I think that if, you know, on most of the measures, you know, we haven't even talked about the potholes and the state of the, the roads mm -hmm. in this city because there's been a lack of investment in very basic infrastructure. And look, I'm an urban designer and a planner by trade. I think about beauty in the city, public art, but I've actually kind of really pulled a lot of that back in the past couple of years because I think we're failing on a lot of basic infrastructure right now. Mm -hmm. So I go back to those pieces and I say, well, you know, being a nice guy isn't enough if the city's sort of falling apart around you. And again, 
uh, I, you know, I agree with Ben as well. John Tory was, it felt like he was about to get into his groove. The housing plan, the new fiscal deal. He was doing some of the stuff that a mayor actually needs to do straight out of the gate. He was just starting to do that. I was fearing, feeling very, very hopeful over the past couple of months. But from a legacy perspective, I don't know. Look at the city eight years ago. Look at the city today. You could argue that the Rob Ford era really drew on the legacy of the investment we saw under David Miller and kind of we, we, we snuck through that. But at the end of that era, we really needed to focus on city building. And we haven't been doing that for eight years. We've been talking about keeping taxes low. We've been talking about uh, cutting city staff and making the bureaucracy lower at the very time when we've really needed to reinvest in the city. So I don't know, what do people remember? I think they remember that for the first time in their lives, they're now seeing homeless people sleeping against their community center just down the street here at Young and Eglinton in Scarborough. Like we, we have a crisis that is, I never would have imagined the magnitude of despair on the TTC and on the streets of this city that I am seeing today. And I think we need to act like we're in a crisis. I agree with Marcus. Maybe this is an opportunity to actually shift the trajectory and do something really bold. I read you every Saturday, and you are occasionally uh, very critical of the mayor and occasionally mm -hmm. praiseworthy of the mayor. Do you think Toronto's better or worse after eight plus years of John Tory? Well, that's going to be a big historical question, isn't it? I mean, I think I think we can sometimes exaggerate the the, the sense of crisis in the city. I agree with everything you say that we. We, there's more homelessness on the streets. There was a stabbing again today on the, on the uh, TTC. All these things are very troubling. A They're, shocking stabbing. A woman stabbed, like, slashed in the face. I know. No, at it's, the it's, 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 it's truly shocking. This didn't used to happen. I know. Uh, but do, do we fully blame the mayor for this? I mean, is he, is he at fault? A lot of other Canadian cities are seeing disorder on their streets as well. Uh, it seems to be a national problem. And I think it's it just important that we don't s surrender to the thought that Toronto is suddenly a hellscape and is going the way of Detroit or something like that. Yes, we have lots of problems, but uh, they're all things we can deal with. More investment, for instance, in mental health seems to be critical. John Tory was calling for a, a national summit on this issue, and I think he was right about that, because it's not something cities alone can, can deal with. So let's, going forward, I think this is a chance for a reset and to have somebody positive saying, look, these things are, are, are critical, but they can be fixed. Is Toronto better or worse after eight plus years of Tory? I have to say worse. Like I said before, by almost every measure, um, mm. things are not good. People do not feel safe here. They can't afford to live here. As a result, we have all these pylon problems, whether it's violence on the TTC, whether it's the state of our streets, whether it's labor shortages, because why don't we have nurses? Why don't we have teachers? Where are all the frontline workers? Well, they can't afford to live in the city. Uh, and again, I think we've gotten to a point where we were so traumatized by this Rob Ford era, that now we're like, well, at least he was better than Rob Ford. But almost a decade later, I'd hope a city like Toronto that has such potential could aim a little bit higher. Ben, what are the odds, you know, we've uh, got new strong mayor powers in this city and whoever, if in fact John Tory leaves and there is a new mayor taking his place and they have these strong mayor powers, what is the possibility that some of the things that Jennifer Kiesmet so disagreed with the mayor on, uh, like rebuilding the Gardner Expressway, like the Scarborough subway, could be revisited by the next mayor. I think that depends on the political stripe of the next mayor and how well they get along with the provincial government because the, the province gave Toronto's mayor strong mayor powers basically based on the character of John Tory, right? Mm -hmm. If John Tory uh, is out of the picture, if a more progressive uh, mayor comes in and uh, you know wants to do things that go against the province, they can't actually use those strong mayor powers. They can only exercise those, those powers if the province says uh, they're allowed to, if they align with provincial priorities. So I think it'd be really interesting to see if, if a, you know, a left-leaning uh, uh, candidate won uh, the mayor's job, whether or not there'd be some changes to the provincial legislation pretty quickly to get rid of those strong mayor powers. Do you see this as an opportunity to revisit all of those issues that you disagreed with John Tory on and, frankly, which he prevailed on? Well, 
you know, we didn't really disagree on that many issues. And the Scarborough subway, that's under construction. That, that, that's happening. And we found a solution to that. We mm -hmm. found a way to actually advance, ad advance that in the end. The biggest issue here really is the rebuilding of the Gardner Expressway because it is the largest capital project. It serves 3% of the morning population. Mm -hmm. We're spending $2 billion so that 3% of the population uh, does not have an additional three minutes to their commute time. So there's there's no there's no mathematical logic to what we're doing on that project. So could they revisit that? Well, they absolutely can revisit it. And we do know, because I did make this one of my key um, campaign platforms, was we do know that the provinces at that time said they were agnostic. They're not going to interfere in the Gardner decision. So that's something where if city council sat down and said, look, We've got to stop throwing money after the bad. We have a history of doing this, by the way. We stopped the Allen Expressway, right? It was half built. We stopped it. We said, bad idea. We'll destroy the city. We didn't stop it. Bill we, Davis Bill stopped Davis. It. Oh, I know. I, I knew <laughs> We're sitting here in the studio had, named after him. You had so to, to get, get Bill that Davis in. into the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Bill Davis did the right thing. Um, so, but I will just say that it's never a good idea. Otherwise, we're going to tear, we're tearing it down right now. But we're actually going to rebuild it again inconceivable. Mm -hmm. um, and then your children and my children are going to sit around this table 15 years from now when a vast majority of the city budget is going to maintaining it and saying, well, why didn't we just put make it an ad grade road? Why is it in the mm -hmm. sky? No city is building elevated expressways because they're too costly to maintain and they destroy the fabric of the city. That decision, I would say, because you said all the decisions, no, not all the decisions, mm -hmm. but that decision is one that has been a poison pill to our municipal budget, and that one ought to be revisited. It was never a good idea. It's still not a good idea. And we, we need the cash. Like, we need the cash to invest in other parts of the city. Can I ask you directly? Sure. You gonna run for mayor? No, no, I'm not. I'm not running from here. Absolutely not. <laughs> well, you did it once before, and you I did, I would did. like the job, obviously. I actually think it's, I think it's actually a great job. I would like the job. I don't want to be a politician. Um, and. For better or worse, I've created a great company. We're absolutely thriving. We've got a ton on our plate, and we're doing the piece that Sabrina said. We were focused on uh, housing for middle-income earners, and the reason I focused on that is because the lifeblood of the city falls apart when you cannot have the people who are critical to the viability of the city living in the city, right? Mm -hmm. It results in a long commute. It results in all kinds of wonky outcomes. So we're focused on building housing. I see building housing for middle income earners as being a critical part of the long-term success of the city. So I'm right where I need to be right now. Okay. I guess in the interests uh, of everybody at the table, I should ask everybody. Anybody else <laughs> running for mayor? Run? Here? Marcus, you're running for mayor? I'm out, sorry. You're out, Sabrina? <laughs> not a chance. Not a chance. Ben? <laughs> no, not, not in the future. Okay, <laughs> just, and neither am I, just so everybody knows. Who's the best person to get the job to replace John Tory? You want to start us off? I mean, I'm, I'm not sure who's the best person. I think there's going to be a lot of people vying for it. I, I think, you know, what was kind of disheartening about the last election was that John Tory was seen as such a formidable candidate that few people actually, you know, signed up to run against them. I think you're seeing the opposite right now. Um, there's a lot of conversations going on at City Hall and elsewhere about who's going to run and, and candidates who might kind of fill um, a similar political space trying to negotiate who's, you know, who's going to run and who's going to step aside for now. Do we assume uh, that the that the sort of the, the left, the New Democrat part of City Hall will coalesce around one candidate as opposed to having multiple people run? It could, it could be difficult. I mean, depending on how you divide the left at, at City Hall, there, there's a couple of names already that seem pretty um, solid to, to be running. Josh Matlow, I think everyone expects him to run. Uh, we heard yesterday uh, NDP, MPP, uh, Bertila Carpache uh, could run as well. Um, there's a few other names in the mix who are kind of to the left of the spectrum, like Anna Bailao. I think you can also expect, though, I think where it's going to get really interesting is to see who uh, the kind of right wing uh, establishment in the city and the province um, uh, coalesced around because you can imagine that political organizers from the conservatives will want to make sure that there's a, a candidate to, to um, you know fend off any left-wing challenger and uh, who exactly that is is unclear at the moment we're hearing people organizing around uh, council like Brad Bradford, um, uh, but also names from uh, the, the provincial level, uh, Stan Cho, and can never rule out a Ford in the Toronto yeah, election. Michael Ford's so Michael there too. Ford uh, could, could be one. So, yeah, it sounds like a lot of names out there. It's going to be a really interesting and, uh, as a political reporter, a pretty exciting uh, election to cover. In your judgment, who does the city need right now as its next mayor? 
Well, you know, I, all these names are being bandied about. It would be nice to see somebody actually from outside of politics jump in. I mean, Jennifer was sort of from outside of politics when she ran, and that was a promising. What are you thinking, Pinball Clemens? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any names at the top top of my uh, top of my mind, but uh, I think uh, it's it's kind of a small pool in City Hall and a bit of an inbred one, if I can put it that way. <laughs> uh, a lot of familiar old names, and it would be nice to see somebody. There's so many entrepreneurs in this city who have done well, so many younger people in the city who could jump in. Uh, I, I, it would be great if this was a wide open, freewheeling race with a lot of big issues on the, on the table. You got a thought as to who the next mayor ought to be? I agree with Marcus that it's exciting that we'll actually have a competition of ideas and hopefully big ideas. Uh, we haven't seen real political competition in the city for almost a decade now, and last time Tory was practically acclaimed. So no matter who it ends up being, I agree it'd be wonderful to see some political outsiders come forward with new ideas, perhaps generational change. Uh, it's an exciting time. Why does the 30-something among us here want generational change? I wonder. <laughs> can't see why that would be. <laughs> uh, this, of course, all presupposes that the current mayor is, in fact, going to leave. That is true. And we don't know 100% for sure that that's going to happen. So what do they say? We shall see. Uh, okay, uh, I want to thank everybody for coming into TVO and having this conversation with us at a very odd time in our history here. Ben Spur, City Hall reporter for the Toronto Star, and of course one of the bylines on Friday's report that led to the current mayor's resignation, or announced resignation we should say. Sabrina Maddow, political columnist for the National Post. And on the other side of the table, Marcus G, the columnist for the Globe and Mail. You can read them every Saturday in what they call Canada's national newspaper. And Jennifer Kiesmat, founder, owner, operator, CEO, <laughs> what else? Runner of Marquee <laughs> Developments, former chief planner for the city, and, of course, a one-time mayoral candidate herself. Thanks, everybody. Great to see you all here. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.